Good morning, Facebook friends, and thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, today is Thursday, which means uh, it's my last day of the work week. I take tomorrow off, so I'm looking forward to that, spending some time with uh, Sweet Dina and Monty, and probably chatting with Weston on the phone. Uh, we usually do like a Skype kind of thing, so that'll be nice. And uh, I've got my couple of visitors here, Dina and Diana. Good morning. Good to see you guys. Took my mom to the airport early this morning around, I think, 5.30 or so. Good morning, Joe. Mom had an early flight, so she spent four days with us, and now she's flying back to Michigan, and she's going to spend time with her family there. Uh, that's where my mom lives, and um, she visits every couple months. Uh, Allegiant has a direct flight, actually, from Flint, Michigan to St. Petersburg, uh, and it's cheap. It's like... 50 round trip, direct flight, you can't beat it. Anyway, hope you guys are doing well. Good morning, Carrie, Nancy, I see all your names there. Joe, good morning, my friend. And Sandra, good morning. <clears throat> Denise, good morning, hope you're feeling better. Uh, I know you're still walking slowly, but it looks like you're healing, and that's good. Been praying for you. Pastor Pat, thank you for joining us. Um, so last night was interesting. Uh, last night was my first night uh, leading the Bible study, trying to make it interactive with you guys. I taught on the Holy Spirit. Julian, Bill, good morning. I hope you got a chance to tune in. If you didn't tune in to our hour-long study of the Holy Spirit, uh, you can still go to my Facebook page or you can go to Park Place Facebook page. It's on both pages and you can watch it from beginning to end. I hope you get a chance to listen to it. Uh, there may be some things that you really like about it. There may be some questions that you have. Feel free to reach out to me. If you have found yourself kind of confused about the Holy Spirit, you're not alone. Uh, you know, nobody has um, understood completely God, obviously, the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're all very much just learning about God, and uh, that's our theology, is the study of God. So we are just constantly learning about God all the time. Good morning, Mary, and happy belated birthday. I think it was yesterday, officially. Uh, so I did write on uh, either your Facebook page or um, I piggybacked off a comment of somebody else's. So I see your comments there, wonderful. I'm glad you're gonna listen to it tonight. It's an hour long, so it's actually like two messages, two sermons, if you look at it that way, but it's teaching. And I want it to be interactive, so I am taking questions during our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, this next week is going to be fun, but I'm hoping for more questions and comments from you guys. Otherwise, it's just me teaching for a long hour. So feel free to share comments and ask questions. All right, well, listen, we have 19 people on here. We're going to have 20 very soon. There we are. We're at 20 uh, because Aunt Jan just joined me. Good morning, Aunt Jan. Uh, thank you for joining me. Listen, this is a special request as well uh, for a simple devotion, and I'm going to be teaching on the life of Solomon. What do we know about the life of Solomon? He was an interesting guy for sure. We know that his father's name was David, King David, and then uh, his name uh, was Solomon, King Solomon. He was literally the third king uh, to the Israelites, wasn't he? Uh, do you remember the name of the first king? Uh, it would be David's predecessor. His name was Saul. When the people came to Samuel and said, make us a king so we can be like other people in other uh, countries, uh, this displeased Samuel. But Samuel went to the Lord and he, he told them their request. And the Lord knew and he says, Samuel, don't, don't feel bad. Uh, they're not rejecting you as king. They're rejecting me. And God was their king, obviously. Uh, but nevertheless, God appointed them a king and that is King Saul. So it was King Saul and then his successor was King David, and then David's successor was his son, um, and that was King Solomon. The interesting thing about King Solomon is the way that he was born and the way he came about through the, um, really, the unhealthy relationship, if you want to call it that, that uh, King David had with Bathsheba, okay? We all know that uh, David did something that wasn't right. We're going to talk about that in our study today. And um, he took someone else's wife, and uh, she became pregnant. <clears throat> that baby ultimately died. But then when her husband was killed, uh, that is Uriah the Hittite, when he was killed, 
um, then uh, King David took Bathsheba to be his wife, and she bore him a son, and they named him Solomon, okay? All right, my friends, let's get started. Uh, if you want to turn over to 1 Kings, that's fine. We're going to be flipping around a little bit today, but a lot of this is just a simple teaching. Uh, really, it's a character sketch. Good morning, Darlene. Thank you for joining me for this morning's devotional. I see Pam there, too. Good morning, Pam. Um, so Solomon is interesting because he made so many mistakes, just like his father, King David, uh, just like me and just like you. We all make so many mistakes, but God is so faithful and merciful and gives us so much grace, my friends. It's overwhelming to me how much grace God gives me that I don't deserve. But anyway, let's talk about King Solomon. <clears throat> now, King Solomon's story begins with his father, of course, I mentioned King David. In 2 Samuel 11, uh, King David didn't go off to war with the soldiers during a particular campaign against the Ammonites. They were always fighting against the Ammonites. And so, you know, this became kind of routine for King David. And he was a great warrior. He was a little bit older in years, maybe a little bit past his prime, perhaps. But nevertheless, here is King David. He's taken a break. He sent his troops out to war. And King David is at home, okay? He's having a hard time sleeping. So, while at his palace, he saw a beautiful woman. As he's on the roof now of his palace, he see a beautiful woman. Her name is Bathsheba, okay? <clears throat> she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, who was one of the most loyal soldiers that King David had. King David didn't care uh, about her being married and ultimately had Uriah killed and Bathsheba moved into his palace. Now, what I'm not sharing with you, or what I skipped over, I guess, in my reading, is that he sent for Bathsheba. She came to him. <clears throat> he impregnated her, okay? She became pregnant, sent word to King David that she was pregnant. Then David, trying to cover up his sin, had Uriah the Hittite killed in battle. And then when Uriah was killed, then King David brought Bathsheba to his own house, to be his wife. Now, polygamy is a little bit of what we're going to be talking about today because it is a little bit more common. Well, it's 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 common in the Old Testament. Um, and David had multiple wives, and Solomon had a lot of wives. We're going to talk about that. So it wasn't necessarily unnatural for David to have more than one wife. However, the way he went about it was sinful, okay? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So, um, Let's see what I want to share with you. Um, so Solomon becomes king. So Bathsheba gave birth to a baby, okay, that ultimately died. That was the first child of King David and Bathsheba. That child was stricken, the Bible says, and died. Now, King David and Bathsheba, and I really believe King David loved Bathsheba, uh, um, she became pregnant again, and this time she gave birth to Solomon, uh, so first king tells us about King David's last years as a ruler. Uh, he had to govern his kingdom from his bedside because of his old age. Uh, an older son uh, of his named Adonijah claimed the throne. God sent Nathan, uh, a prophet, uh, to Bathsheba so he could tell her what she must do um, to stay alive and have Solomon to become king. Now, it was understood that Solomon would become king, but this particular son of David, <clears throat> born not to not from Bathsheba, but from another wife, his name was Adonijah, Ad and chose to make himself king, even while King David was still alive. So Nathan went to Bathsheba and said, this is not right. And King David had his servants proclaim Solomon, the next ruler, all authority of the land, uh, was given to King Solomon. So King Solomon wasn't necessarily David's first choice, though it, he may have been. Uh, King Solomon was God's choice. So I think it's important to recognize that. Now Solomon was very wise. God had appeared to Solomon in a dream. The interesting thing between the difference between Solomon and King David, uh, his predecessor and his father, was that God spoke to King David through the prophets. I mentioned Nathan. Uh, but you know what? God spoke directly to King Solomon. And that's what I love about King Solomon. He actually had a, 
a more more intimate kind of relational uh, conversation with the Lord, sometimes through dreams. But nevertheless, I love the fact that the Lord appeared to King Solomon and uh, spoke directly to him. The Lord told Solomon he could have whatever he desired because he truly worshiped and honored him um, as his father did. <clears throat> now notice I said he honored him. I didn't say he was perfect. Uh, we know that King David wasn't perfect, and I've already talked a little bit about um, some of the um, indiscretions of King David's life. Uh, King David did several things that were wrong. He also counted the fighting men. Um, he had this terrible sin with Bathsheba and went outside of his covenant marriage relationships, and he took Bathsheba to be his wife, and he also murdered her husband. So King David, in some ways, and compared to, I guess, in our day, would be considered a bad person. But yet God said he has a, he has a heart after me. He's a man after God's own heart, was what they said about, uh, God said about King David. So if God felt that way about King David, uh, how does God feel about you, my friends? Good morning, Sue. Uh, so with all the things that we've done, all of our transgressions, all of our sins, uh, God doesn't hold those against us. Now, he will, he will discipline us. The Bible says, do not dis, uh, despise the Lord's discipline. He disciplines those he loves and calls sons. And certainly we receive that. We're thankful for that, that God doesn't hold our sin against us. But he still sees a heart that is trying to please God. And he saw that in King David. Even though King David sinned greatly, he saw a heart that was trying to please him, pursue him. Uh, and so we see this in the beginning of Solomon's life. So the Lord came to Solomon in a dream and said, you know, Solomon, <clears throat> I was with your father. I'm with you. Uh, ask me anything you want, and certainly I will give you whatever it is that you ask for. Now, Solomon chose wisdom as a gift from God, and the Lord blessed him with wealth, honor, and a long life because of his choice. Now, we find this in 1 Kings 3, 16 through 28. Okay, 1 um, Kings 3. I'm not going to read it all, but it, it 1 Kings 3 Solomon asked for wisdom because he's a young king. He's a young ruler. And I think that he just feels he's way in over his head. And when he's way in over his head, my friends, <clears throat> he's looking at this task that's ahead of him. And he's saying, how can I do this? I'm just a child. And um, one of the ways that he uh, receives wisdom is instantaneous. He's just, God just gave him wisdom, my friends. And we learn about him uh, basically having to be a judge and ruler between two prostitutes. Uh, both of them had a young child. Um, and one of them went to sleep with her baby, rolled over and suffocated the child. And then what happened was the other woman <clears throat> who lived in the same house, whose baby was healthy, um, woke up and found by her side a dead baby. And the other woman had a living baby. So the woman that had the dead baby woke up and saw that her baby had died, but then realized that wasn't her baby, it was the other woman's baby. So a dispute rose between whose baby was the living baby. And these two ladies came to King Solomon, <clears throat> and King Solomon said in all of his wisdom, he says, well, it's going to be very easy for me to judge uh, who the real mother is. Uh, let's just... Uh, divide the baby in two and give each woman half the baby. And obviously, the real mother said, no, don't do that. Give her the baby. It's fine. And that was a very wise decision by King Solomon because he said, you are the mother because you would rather give up your baby than to see your baby killed. And so it made great sense. And so people came from all over to hear about uh, the wonderful life Solomon lived and all the wisdom that he shared with others. This is just one simple example. Um, but his fame spread wide and far. Solomon's wisdom has also been recorded in the Bible within the books of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. These are the books that he has written in Song of, Song of Solomon. Um, it's It's been recorded that he also wrote possibly um, Song of Songs, or Song of Sol Solomon, uh, however you want to word it. Uh, different Bibles have different... Uh, I wonder what mine has, actually. I'm not really sure. It's known as the uh, poetic literature. There's there's uh, there's Psalms. Uh, sometimes um, Job is thrown in there <clears throat> as a um, poetic literature. Uh, not finding it real 
easily here. I think it's after Ecclesiastes, actually. Song of Solomon. Your, your, your book might have something different. But let's talk about the end of Solomon's reign. Now, <clears throat> then we're going to be talking about some very practical lessons uh, that Solomon practiced. And I think that's going to be the practical lesson in our devotional this morning. In 1 Kings 9, Solomon builds the temple of God. That's one of the greatest things that he did. You know, he obviously was wise and a good judge, but he also built the temple of the Lord. Remember, David wanted to build the temple, but David was a man of war. And God said, you are a man of blood. You are a man of war. Yes, your heart is after me, but you're not going to build the temple. Your son Solomon is going to build the temple. Now, after Solomon was finished building the temple, God warned Solomon that if he doesn't obey him, he will cut off Israel from the land that he gave them. Solomon's greatest sin was taking too many foreign wives. Notice I didn't say foreign wives or too many wives. He took too many foreign wives. God was always afraid that, you know, the Israelites would enter mingle and intermarry with other nations and therefore their hearts would be turned by the the idolatry of their wives and that's exactly what happened here with solomon now um first kings 11 first kings 11 verses 1 through 3 states that solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines all right i have a hard time with one wife I mean, I'm really, I really try to be a good husband, but really 700? Like, how can anyone manage 700 wives, 300 concubines? Can you imagine the honey-do list? Uh, I, I, I can't imagine, you know, trying to please uh, 700 wives, 300 concubines. Now, these were mostly gifts to King Solomon, but nevertheless, um, I'm sorry to degrade women. It sounds degrading. It's just, it's just history. I'm, I'm sharing. Uh, biblical facts here. Uh, women were gifts at that time because Solomon was the richest man who ever lived. And um, he had now the not only the wonderful temple built for the Lord, but he also had a wonderful mansion um, that, he, that he lived in and 700 wives, 300 concubines. And concubines were interesting. They weren't necessarily wives, but they were women who took care of some of his needs. So they may be inside the mansion they may be cleaning cooking that kind of thing um, but they were at his um, becking call if you will all right that's all i'm going to say about that so you can just fill in the blanks if you want to but god decided to divide up the kingdom from the lineage of david but not to completely take it away because of the promise that god made to david so god was upset with king solomon the last part of solomon's rule was not good according to god after ruling the land for 40 years, Solomon died and was buried in the city of David. So um, the interesting thing about King Solomon is that he actually started out really, really strong in his um, love for the Lord. But you know, it was women that turned his heart away. L let me rephrase that. I'm going to rephrase that because it wasn't women that turned his heart against God. It was his love of women that turned his heart against God. Because see, Solomon had a choice. Listen, my friends, if somebody gives you a gift, it's fine, you can accept it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me how many women were in the palace of King Solomon, but King Solomon decided to allow them to have their pagan worship. King Solomon decided to partake in some of their idolatry and their pagan worship. It was his decision, my friends. It wasn't something that was forced upon him. King Solomon was responsible for his own downfall, okay? So there's some practical lessons that we can learn from King Solomon. I've got 15 minutes to get through this, but they're really simple. As we're doing kind of a character sketch of King Solomon, I want to thank you for joining me for this morning's devotion. King Solomon was cool in some ways. The way he started was really, really great. I love the way he, 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 he asked for wisdom. But later on, boy, did he struggle. Uh, so the first lesson I think we can learn from the life of King Solomon, as we're learning from basically his, his good attributes and his bad ones, is that prayer can change your life. One prayer changed Solomon's life. Have you ever thought about this? Solomon had an amazing spiritual experience with God. Yeah, he had a conversation with God. 
God offered Solomon anything, my friends. Can you imagine just for a moment if God said to you, good morning, Fran, thank you for joining us, and Pastor David, can you imagine if God said, I'll give you anything you want? What would you say? I mean, I, I mean, if you're not a king, you're not gonna ask for wisdom, I wouldn't think. I don't know what you would ask for. He was already a king when God asked him, uh, what is it I can do for you, you know? Uh, you're not a king, so you may not ask for wisdom. You may ask for a great homeless ministry, or you might ask for um, the, you know, the, the ability to, to, to evangelize. I don't know. You would probably ask for something that is um, not worldly, because you're already spiritual. And Solomon, to some degree, was already spiritual. So he asked for a spiritual request, something that he could use to enhance and build the kingdom and, and, and encourage the people. And he did that. And so prayer can change life because um, I love the fact that um, King Solomon prayed and asked God for wisdom. If you're going through a rough time or struggling with a tough decision, take a moment to pray and reflect. Remember, God wants to give you to the desires of your heart, whatever they might be. I mean, um, prayer can bring forth the answer or enlightenment that you need. We, we have not because we ask not. That is not a prosperity scripture, my friends. That is just the Bible, okay? Uh, I don't believe in prosperity preaching. In fact, I've been kind of rallying against it here lately. I'm on this, I'm on this kick, I guess, against prosperity preaching. But I, but I do believe that when Solomon asked for wisdom, he wasn't asking for prosperity. God gave him prosperity because he was delighted that Solomon didn't ask for it. So my friends, what does that tell you about prosperity? That if God brings it, receive it. But God does not equate prosperity with spirituality. Um, and, and, and those pastors that are preaching that have to stand before God someday. And I do not want to be around when that happens, my friends. Prayer can change your life. And it changed Solomon's life. Number two, God is honored by excellence. Hmm, think about that for a moment. Sue, and I know there's others that are watching. Fran and Pam, thank you for watching. Remember, my friends, God is honored by our excellence. Don't give God your scraps. Remember when God asked for the first fruits of Abel and Cain? Did he ask for just any sacrifice? No, Abel, Abel brought the best sacrifice, and God commended him. And then Cain brought a lousy sacrifice, and God warned him, didn't he? And I love that. God wants our excellence. He wants the best of the best because he deserves it. David and Solomon were given specific instructions on the temple's construction that was to be built. Solomon built the temple to God's exact specifications. Both God and his people were honored by his beautiful place of worship. You don't have to make a grand gesture to do something elaborate, but whatever you do, it must be done to the best of your ability, my friends. That means we don't, prayer, we don't pray half-hazardly. It means we don't give half-hazardly. It means we don't, we don't offer our ministry service half-heartedly. We give all of it, my friends. We give until it hurts. We pray until it hurts. We worship until it hurts, my friends. We be sacrificial. We give God everything that is excellent. We give him our very best. God wants you to give your all because you are honoring God by your excellence. How many of you know that we are updating our church constantly? Our foyer is beautiful. Parts of our sanctuary has become beautiful. Our office for your flooring is beautiful. We have painted almost the entire church. Um, at least, you know, the, um, the common areas. We've done so much work in the hallways, my friends. We painted baseboards. We've recarpeted. We, this is God's house. And I know that God's temple is inside your heart. But this is where we come together for corporate worship. Let us come together and worship in, with excellence. God was very um, particular about how he wanted the temple to be with King David and King Solomon, and they built it according to his specifications. My friends, I think God deserves our best. 
That doesn't mean we have to have gold-plated, um, you know, um, faucets and things like that. Uh, certainly, I don't live like that, and I don't think this house of worship should be like that. But by all means, I think when you neglect the house of worship, my friends, uh, but you live in really nice homes, well, I can go back to some Old Testament scriptures and remind you that God wants us to value his house where he worships as well. And that includes his place of worship, a place where we get together to worship, as well as our own bodies, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. All right. Another lesson that we learned from King Solomon is that wisdom glorifies God. First Kings 4.29, God gave wisdom to great Solomon and very great insight was given to him and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand of the seashore. First Kings 10.24, people came from every nation to consult him. Think about that. Don't you wish you had a wise friend? Maybe you do. Maybe you have a friend with the gift of wisdom because I do believe it's a spiritual gift, my friends. And then we want to spend time with them and consult them. There are people in my life that I consult with that I think have a certain amount of wisdom. My friend Alan has a certain amount of wisdom. And I know that uh, he may be listening to me this morning, but his wife certainly is. And, he, and when he speaks, I listen. There's other people. I have a friend named Bill who has a lot of wisdom. I have a friend named Paul who has a lot of wisdom. Actually, there's two of them, uh, both of them named Paul. They have a lot of wisdom. And when they speak to me, I listen to it and I, I process it. And I might even pray about it because there's certain people that God puts in your life with a certain amount of wisdom. So wisdom glorifies God, my friends. Think about that. That's lesson number three. All right. Lesson number four, have integrity with handling success. Let's talk about King Solomon for a minute. Solomon's kingdom was marked by unprecedented peace. He didn't have to go to great wars like his father David did. Wealth and splendor everywhere he looked. People were literally sending him gold and silver and bronze and all of these beautiful materials to build the Lord's temple and, and, and his mansion to update and to create. He had wisdom to create and and uh, people around him that would help him to handle his success. However, he didn't handle it very well. He was the wisest man who ever lived, yet he did not handle his prosperity well. Think about that. The greater our prosperity or success, the more likely we are to forget our need for God. You know that's true in my life. I can actually tell you, and, and maybe you receive it as braggadocious or whatever, but I don't care. Uh, there was a year, 2016, that I personally made a million dollars. And uh, the company made four million. I made one million. And I remember um, finally getting to that pinnacle. I had come close a couple years previously, but finally that year, I, on paper, made a million dollars. So in my mind, that was, um, I was in the, I guess, the top 1%. A great pride filled my heart, and I did not handle my prosperity or success with integrity, my friends. I remember when the tax bill came in because I was a W, I was a 1099 worker for my own company, which was an LLC. Um, I remember receiving my tax bill. I was not ready for my tax bill. Can you imagine getting a tax bill after you've made that kind of money in one year? Listen, listen to me, my friends. I'm not sharing this with you because I handled it well. I'm sharing this with you because I didn't handle it well. To be honest, I had eight offices running. It almost cost me my marriage. It almost cost me my family. It nearly cost me the shirt off my back. Now, I kept some of the offices. I closed some down. And I realized that if I didn't pull it together and become a man of great integrity and get back to my first love, which is Jesus, I would lose everything. And Dina, sweet Dina, was very patient with me, and she waited for me, and we prayed together, and we sought the Lord together, and I repented for my life, which was um, just, I, I think it was just greed and pride, and that just took over my life. 
And, you know, you can ask for specific details. I guess if you want to have a cup of coffee with me, I could probably share more with you. I'm not going to do it on a public forum. But if you need to know more, you can ask me more. But, but the truth of the matter is, my friends, you know what? God has humbled me. And God has humbled people that don't handle success with integrity, my friends. Not everyone is supposed to be successful. Not everyone is supposed to prosper. And I know you would love to know what it's like to make that kind of money, but the truth of the matter is I'm so much happier living essentially paycheck to paycheck. Sure, I've got savings. Sure, I've got a little bit of money tucked away. Not a lot, but you know, my sons actually have more money than I do, but I live paycheck to paycheck very simply. Today I'm making my mortgage payment and I am so thankful. Some of you are saying, wow, pastor, it sounds like you're two weeks late. You know, I am two weeks late. But I don't mind being two weeks late. Uh, they can't report me to the credit bureau until I'm 30 days late. But when I have the money, I make my mortgage payment. And I still live the way I want to live, which, in my opinion, is still fairly simple, my friends. So I haven't always handled success and prosperity with integrity. I am like King Solomon, or was like King Solomon. Now I want to live simply, humbly, and live on the money that I make from not only my church, but also a couple of my other investments. Because God is faithful, I can do that with great integrity. So have integrity when God gives you success. That's a wonderful lesson. Also, number three, bad, or number five, bad company corrupts good character. You've heard this adage before. Bad company corrupts good character. Solomon was not immune from the influence of those who chose to spend his time with him. Being supremely wise and God's anointed did not protect him from this temptation. My friends, God's anointing is on you, but it does not save you. Why? Because you have free will. You have free will to do what you please. When I had those few years or those couple years, now I had my company for five, but there were a couple years there that the success nearly ruined me. I wanted to tell you that, you know, I handled it well at first. I didn't handle it well as things began to kind of escalate and ramp up even more. We will become like those we chose not to be like if we do not stay close to Jesus. We have to be in tune with his Holy Spirit or bad company will corrupt us, my friends. Why did bad company corrupt, corrupt Solomon? Because he loved those wives. He loved them. And he began to worship how they worshiped. He allowed them to worship how they chose to worship, according to their ancestors, my friends. And that's the thing, is we have to surround ourselves with people who love God. And there was a time in my life in which I surrounded myself with other business owners and wealthy people and affluent people and famous people or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, restaurant owners. And, and I was living in Las Vegas and I was, you know, I was doing well. I was living in Reno, living in Las Vegas at the same time, going back and forth between all eight offices um, around that area. And I wasn't hanging out with Christians. I was going to church every Sunday. I was saying my prayers. I was giving my tithe and all of that. But my friends, you know, bad, bad company corrupts good character. If it happened in my life, if it can happen in Solomon's life, it'll happen in your life if you're not careful. Please pick and choose your friends very, very carefully. That's why the fellowship of believers needs each other. We all need each other. And then number six, good steward. So God said to him, 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, that is, God, uh, God knows that he asked for wisdom, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never be anyone like you, nor will there ever be again. This is what God says to King Solomon in 1 Kings 3, 11 and 12. Solomon was viewed as a king 
and he was thought highly of. Since he was wise and looked out for others, many people believed in him and looked to him for support. So he was, at first, a very good steward of what God had entrusted to him, and he lost his way. There's a lesson here about jealousy. And I want to read um, a verse from uh, the Song of Solomon. I mentioned it earlier. Um, Song of Psalms or Song of Solomon. A lot of you aren't familiar with this little book in the Bible, but chapter 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is, is as strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Good morning, Bernadette. I love that verse, my friends. I'm going to say it to you again so you can look it up on your own. Song of Solomon 8.6. Very powerful. It is very easy to become jealous, but you have to remain humble and grounded in the Lord. Do not allow jealousy to take over your thoughts because it can make you toxic. Now, the Bible does say that God is a jealous God. Yes, it's true that the Bible does say that. God is a jealous God because you belong to him. You belong to him. I see Pastor Peggy texting me during my devotion. You belong to him, my friends. If you belong to him, he is jealous for you. You know, and that is a good jealousy, my friends. But there is something in the heart of man that can be very insecure. There is something in the heart of a woman that can be very insecure and very jealous. And King Solomon struggled with all of these mixed emotions and feelings. And um, he didn't handle all of that right. There's a lesson to be learned about loyalty from King Solomon. David had admonished Solomon to serve the Lord with a loyal heart. But the Holy Spirit tells us later on in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 4, that Solomon's heart was not loyal to the Lord his God. Boy, that's disappointing. To think that your life started out so strong and became so weak. So disloyal. Loyalty is defined by the idea of completeness and wholeheartedness. Loyalty means wholeheartedness, my friends. Life will give you struggles and problems that you must overcome. When you try to find your path, you must remain humble and level-headed. Deep down, you know what is right and wrong, but never lose sight of your morals. Never lose sight of the morals that you have. Never lose sight of your loyalty to God. Your loyalty to God, not your loyalty to the church. I'm not talking about your loyalty to your family. I'm not talking about your loyalty as it re involves resources or money and, and being a good steward. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about loyalty as it pertains to God. Solomon turned his back on God, my friends. Okay, there's a lesson to be learned there. I'm almost finished, I promise. Number nine, vanity. There's 10, there's 10 lessons total. Number nine is vanity. One of Solomon's favorite words in Ecclesiastes, and you know the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a great book. Just don't read it when you're depressed. It's not good. It'll make you more depressed. Um, but one of his words that he uses 38 times in the book of Ecclesiastes, which he wrote at the end of his life, is vanity. 38 times he writes the word vanity. The Hebrew word for vanity literally means hevel, okay? It means emptiness, futility, and vapor. Hevel. It means vanity. Emptiness, futility, and vapor. Why vapor? Well, think about it. It appears and it disappears quickly, like a vapor mist. It leaves nothing behind. Vanity leaves nothing behind and does not satisfy. It's vain. Never allow vanity to consume your life because things that are vain will not last and have no sustainable value for your life. Stay faithful and do not allow material items to become who you are, my friends. 
Don't be like your pastor who all those years ago valued all these things, you know, above God. There was a period in my life in which I really struggled with material things and perception and 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 in my mind I was doing it for my children and I was doing it for their legacy and for you know I have children right that are profoundly disabled in my mind I was thinking I need to work harder I need to get more blessing I need to invest more I need to you know and I had six homes at one time my friends what happened was I was doing it perhaps for the right reason but I allowed sin to come into my life and I became vain and vanity in material things and in wealth and in all of this was meaningless. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says everything is meaningless, a chasing after the wind, except the love that we have for the Lord. If you think about it for a minute, the only lasting legacy that you can leave is your great love for Jesus. Think about it, you can leave a house to your children. You can leave a million dollars to your children, but what's gonna happen after that generation passes? There is no lasting legacy in material items, my friends. There is no lasting legacy in everything I was working hard for. The only lasting legacy that we have is the love that we share, is those that we lead to Jesus. Yes, it's a chasing after the wind. Everything is meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. That's what it says. You're right, Pam. So vanity, my friends. I live a life without vanity. I chase after the things that are of God now. I only want Jesus to reign supreme in my life. Not pride, not greed, not houses and material things that I can leave to my children. Listen, if I leave $5 to my children, that's probably more than I deserve. And it's more than they deserve. Because you know what? They're gonna be taken care of. I have to trust that the investment that I have put into them, the love of Jesus and the care and the love that I have shown them is greater than any amount of money. I believe that, but they are taken care of. And I am so thankful for that. Uh, number 10, live life to the fullest. Now, Ecclesiastes 1.14 says, I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. That's a different version for you. I like that. Ecclesiastes 1.14. Think about King Solomon, this great wise man at the end of his life. He writes these words to begin this little book. I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, it's all meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. Have you ever chased after the wind? It doesn't get you anywhere. Live each day as if it is your last, because my friends, it might be. Appreciate everything that God has blessed you with and never take anything for granted because everything you have, yourself included, everything comes from the hand of God is extended to you. God has given you everything at your disposal, my friends. He has not withheld anything from you. It doesn't matter uh, if you're living in a single wide, a double wide, or a mansion. What you have received is from the Lord. Receive it with thanksgiving. Don't compare it with what other people have. And don't chase after all those things that will not build you up spiritually. Our world is tempting and they will throw all kinds of things at us. Who are they, Pastor? They are the demons. They are the spiritual forces of this world, the temptation, the corruption of this world being thrown at you. It's almost like we are being uh, blindfolded, walking through a maze. And all we can do is follow after the voice of Jesus while we're listening carefully to the still small voice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is calling us home, there now is obstacles being put in our path, my friends. You know, it's a ball here. It's maybe a, a piece of a, a furniture or an end table. Uh, we've hit all those things with our pinky toes. We know what they feel like. And we bump up against these things that are worldly, my friends. Ouch. We didn't see that. 
We didn't, we didn't, we didn't know it was there. But my friends, ignore the things of this world that so quickly can turn your heart away from God and live for Jesus. Start your legacy for Jesus. Let that be enough, my friends. I've taken 45 minutes with you and I apologize. I try to stay to 30 minutes. But anyway, we have studied the life of Solomon. It was a special request. So there you go, my friend, who gave me this special request. And um, a lot can be learned, I think, from King Solomon. And uh, I have learned a lot from my experiences. I've been greatly, greatly humbled by them. So if I've shared anything with you that surprised you, um, just know that I've also shared with you my failures, my struggles. I have shared with you that I've had success. But if anybody can write a book about business, it's me. Because I could write a book about what not to do in business. And it would probably be a bestseller. Because if you don't do what I did, you could be a great success. Because I am not a success story. I am a story of a man who had a little dream and chased after it. And God began to bless it. And then I got carried away with it. So uh, I'm sorry if that sounds braggadocious. But the truth of the matter is, uh, I am very humbled by my past. Very humbled by my, by my mistakes. And I'm not asking for sympathy. I'm just saying that I've learned some lessons and I wouldn't be here without them. So I'm thankful that God has humbled me and brought me to a place in which I want nothing more than to share a lasting legacy that Jesus can change your life. My friends, turn your life over to Jesus. It is the greatest decision you can ever make. It is the greatest decision that you can ever make. October 23rd, 1993, I made that decision that I was going to love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And even though I've wandered off that path and I've been distracted, um, I've never, ever lost my love for Jesus. And now, all these years later, it has reawakened. And I am so thankful for that. I'm not letting go of Jesus. And I encourage you, my friends, don't let go of Jesus. He certainly won't let go of you. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this time together today. We thank you, Lord, for our failures. We thank you for our success. We thank you for the wisdom that you bring to us, any prosperity that you give us, whether we are homeless or whether we have plenty. We have learned to be content in all circumstances, as the Apostle Paul wrote. And God, that only comes through walking with you, Jesus. It can't come in anything of this world and any of the things this world has to offer. For I've dabbled in most things and I've understood most things. And King Solomon, who is the wealthiest man who ever lived, realized toward the end of his lifetime that everything is meaningless, a chasing after the wind, except God, except loving him wholeheartedly, as Caleb did. It's reported that Caleb loved the Lord wholeheartedly. And David, King David, was a man after God's own heart. May I be thought of like that, Lord Jesus. May those who are listening today be thought of like that too. We thank you for this simple character sketch and Bible study and and simple reminder, let us learn from Solomon's lessons. And Father, let us learn from my pain as well, that all we need is Jesus, simply Jesus. And help us to keep the first things first, and we won't leave that path as long as we hear the still small voice of our shepherd who calls us by name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, my friends. I want to just say um, it was great to be with you this morning. Today is Thursday. Tomorrow's my day off. I'll be with you at home at 11 a.m. I hope you get to join me. I don't know what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow morning. I haven't worked on it yet, but I will. And uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Be blessed, my friends. Have a wonderful day. And don't forget to reach out to someone today and tell them you love them.